you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. You can also be finding Ephesians chapter 5. Today we're going to begin a two-week series called Love Never Fails. This coming Friday is Valentine's Day, just in case you're not ready for that. You have a few days to prepare. Um, but I wanted to use the next two Sundays to really capitalize and take advantage of where so many people will have their thoughts focused, and that is on love. The underlying text for this series is uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 8. And if you get a, a Springfield paper, then and you've read it, then you probably saw that the USA Weekend is Dr. Phil and Robin McGraw. And it really caught my attention because it says, Make Love Last. And so I was interested to read what Dr. Phil and Robin had to say in light of what I'm going to be saying today uh, from the Word of God, and uh, I hope that you are ready to listen, because I'm ready to preach. I've been ready to preach for a while now. <laughs> Looking over the notes last night, I was concerned I wasn't going to be able to sleep uh, because I was so excited. So, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, Paul writes, Love never fails. The word that Paul uses here translated as fails is a word that means to perish. It means to disappear. It means to cease. In fact, Paul goes on to write in verse 8, he says that prophecies will cease. And one day prophecies will cease. There's going to come a day where there's no need for any more prophecies. He says, tongues will be still. And he says, knowledge will pass away. Love, however, never comes to an end. Love never fails. Today we're going to look at love never fails in the context of, of marriage. Now I realize today that some of you, you're not married and and so you might say, well, what's in it for me? I promise you there's something in it for you because really the principles that we're going to be looking at today, you can really apply them to any relationship. We're going to be focusing on the marriage relationship, but I believe with all my heart that God is all about relationships. He's about our relationship with Him. He's about our relationship with each other. And so, you know, relationships matter. They matter to God, they should matter to us, and, and so uh, I hope that you'll take the principles that we look at today and you'll apply them, um, not just to your marriage, but also to the other relationships that you enjoy in this life. But today we're going to be looking at uh, Love Never Fails in the context of a marriage relationship. Next week, uh, we're going to be looking at Love Never Fails in the context of parenting. So, let's get started, let's see what we can discover today that will help us in our marriages. The reality today is that while love never fails, marriages do. Statistics reveal to us that a first marriage failure rate is 50%. Statistics also tell us that a second marriage failure rate is 67%. And if that same person gets married a third time, the failure rate is 73 Now, we know there are always exceptions, and I know people who have been the exception to these uh, statistics. And so we know that there are exceptions, but these stati statistics, and I'm going to trip over that word probably a lot today, so just forgive me. These statistics are representative of the norm. 
Now, before I go any further, I want to stop and I want to address those of you who have experienced what might be considered a failed marriage. I want to say to you what the Bible says in Romans 8.1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The word that Paul uses here for condemnation is a word that means damnatory sentence. If you're here today and you've experienced divorce, understand that there is no sentence of condemnation in Christ Jesus. The purpose of this message is not to hang the letter D around your neck and offer you words of condemnation. That is not the heart of this message. This message isn't going to be about if you would have done this, this, and this, your marriage would have succeeded. This message isn't about what was. This message isn't about what could have been. This message is all about what is and can be. See, this message is all about infusing hope into marriages that are struggling and on the brink of death. Condemnation is not the word of the day. Restoration is the word of the day. And I just really want you to hear the heart of God today, and I want you to hear the heart of your pastor. In no way does God, nor does your pastor, want you to walk away feeling condemned. Because it would be contrary to the word of God. So I hope you'll walk away feeling encouraged today that there is hope in Jesus. Now, there are many reasons given as to why marriages fail. Perhaps you've heard some of them. If you were to uh, read any marriage book, especially from a Christian perspective, but certainly from a, from a secular perspective, you would, you would find that most marriage books will list some reasons given as to why marriages fail. Um, Usually at the top of the list is financial problems. There's a great burden that comes with financial debt. When you're struggling, it, it just seems to, to bleed into your marriage. You begin to fight about money. And, and so it, 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 it actually puts a wedge between a, a husband and wife so many times. Financial problems, it's usually at the very top of the list. And so when I counsel with people, I, I try to give them direction as to, you know, at least pre-marital pre -marital counseling, I try to give them a direction. Listen. You need, to get your, you need to get your checkbook in order, uh, because if not, it's going to cause you all kinds of problems uh, in your marriage. Another reason is, is, is family problems, uh, meddling in-laws, uh, or uh, disagreements on how to, how to raise the children. Uh, that, can, that, can, that can cause problems in marriages, and many marriages will fail because of family problems. Sometimes faith problems. Uh, people come from different faith backgrounds, and, and so they can't find agreement when it comes to faith issues, and that, that will create a big, big problem in a marriage. You know, there's something to be said about do not be unequally yoked. God knows what he's talking about. And, and, and so it's important, you know, that, that you understand before you get into a marriage, you know, where does your future spouse, where do they stand on faith? And then another reason why marriages sometimes fail is faithfulness problems. A spouse hasn't been faithful to the marriage bed and marriage relationship, and that can cause problems. And so these are just a few reasons that are given. They're common reasons as to why marriages fail. But let me just boil all of these reasons and any other reason down to an overarching reason that marriages fail. And, and this is not going to be mind-boggling at all. The overarching reason that marriage is failed is because someone or everyone in the marriage relationship has quit. Now, I know that's, that's about as earth-shattering of a statement as saying the reason for death is because a heart stops beating. But there are reasons a heart stops beating, right? Right? You know there are reasons people quit on their marriage? One reason that people quit on their marriage is because they say it's, it's just too hard. 
I don't want to do this anymore because it's, it's just too difficult. I, I quit. Now, don't be deceived today. Those of you young people, please hear me today. Don't be deceived. Marriage is hard. It really is. Marriage is extremely difficult. In 13 days, and I'm so excited about this, my dad and mom are going to be celebrating 50 years of marriage. And I think I'm more excited about it than they are. <laughs> you know, it's just not, I'm like, what do you want to do to celebrate? And they're like, you know, let's, you want to have a big reception? No, no, let's not do that. No, let's just go out together as a family. All right, as long as we celebrate. Now, if you were to talk with them, or you were to talk with anybody that's been married for any length of time, and ask them, has it been easy? They would say, absolutely not. See, every season of their marriage has brought different challenges. But neither one of them quit. They persevered through the challenges and they found a way to fight for their relationship instead of fighting each other. Marriage is hard. It is. It's hard, isn't it, sweetie? Especially with me. God had to give her extra grace to be married to me. Because you know what? All of us are difficult. Do you realize, you know, all of us have difficult people in our lives? And the reality is, we're someone's difficult person. All of us. I mean, there's somebody that's saying today, that person that goes to Orchard Crest, they're my difficult person. That's pretty humbling, isn't it? We always look at other, boy, those, those, that's my difficult person in my life. And somebody else is saying, and that person is my difficult person. But marriage is hard. And, and there's only one couple that has ever known what an easy marriage was like. And that was Adam and Eve. And even their easy marriage eventually became a difficult marriage. When God joined Adam and Eve together, he did so. It was the perfect environment. <laughs> There was absolutely nothing that stood against their relationship with God. There was nothing that stood against their relationship with each other. The only thing they had to do was keep, to keep it that way was to trust God and to obey His Word. That's it. God had said in Genesis 2.16, Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? The one thing God said they couldn't do. They ate from it. And the moment they did, their relationship with God and their relationship with each other was severed. And at that moment, the moment that man's relationship, specifically Adam, Adam and Eve, but the moment that man's relationship with God was severed, God had a choice to make. His choice was this choice, to quit or not to quit. On the relationship. See, the easy relationship that he had shared with man, it had just been transformed into a very difficult one. And you know what? It wasn't his doing. It wasn't his fault. God could have quit. He could have tried to get with someone else, but he didn't. You know what God did? He made the choice to fight for the relationship by providing a way for the relationship to be restored. And that way was a sacrifice to cover the sin of man. If you were to look at Genesis 3.21, the Bible says that God clothed them with animal skins. That was it. He clothed Adam and Eve with, with, um, with animal skins. And so he, he provided a way for their sin to be covered. And it's just really a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ to how God covered our sins. In Jesus Christ. And so he made a way for man's relationship to be restored with him. And God made a way for man's relationship to be restored with each other. Jesus Christ is the great reconciler between God and man. And Jesus Christ is the great reconciler between 
mankind. Including husbands and wives. So one reason that people quit on marriage is because it's, it's just too hard. And it is. It's hard. And another reason people quit on marriage is because they're not happy. I'm just not happy anymore. And, and, I, and I know that God wants me to be happy, and, and so because I'm not happy, I, I quit. Today, I just want to submit to you that God's main purpose in creating marriage was not for our happiness, but for our holiness. You know, marriage is something that God uses to conform us into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. That really is the heart of marriage. Marriage was designed to conform us to be more like Jesus. It's about our holiness. It's, it's not so much about our happiness. Now, as we, as we are conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, you know what comes as a, as a, as a product of that? Happiness. Happiness is not the main purpose of marriage. The reality is that marriage is a mirror. It's a reflection of the kind of relationship that God desires to have with us. I want you to listen to, to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5. Because this really lays it out for you clearly. That marriage is, is a mirror of what God desires. The kind of relationship that God, God desires to have with us. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 31 and 32. It says, For this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become flesh. Now, if you stop right there, you would probably think that Paul was writing about an earthly relationship, a relationship between a, a husband and a wife, right? Oh, but Paul goes on. He says, This is a profound mystery. But I'm not talking about, he says, I'm not talking, he said, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. He said, I'm not talking about a husband and a wife. I'm talking about my relationship with the church. He says, for this reason, a man will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. For what reason? For the reason of illustrating the oneness that God desires to have with us and the actions that he took to make it possible. See, the reason marriage is so sacred is because of what it represents. And that is God's relationship with man and man's relationship with God. God has always used marriage as a reflection of his relationship with man and man's relationship with him. Always. The book of Hosea is a perfect example. Now, Hosea was a prophet of God, and a prophet of God was basically a spokesman to the people of Israel on behalf of God. When God had something to say to the people of Israel, he would tell the prophet, the prophet would in turn tell the people. Well, in the book of Hosea, we find God telling Hosea to marry a prostitute. Now, fathers, how many of you, when it came time to talk with your children about who they should marry, how many of you sat them down and said, son, I want you to marry a prostitute? <laughs> Show of hands. Guess what? I'm not going to sit bitly down someday and say, son, you have made me so proud. I just want you to know... Marry a prostitute. <laughs> Mama's down there shaking her head, no, no, no. And so is Daddy. Yet we find God telling Hosea to do that very thing. Go marry a prostitute. Whose name, by the way, was Gomer? Now, why would God do such a thing? I mean, if we wouldn't do such a thing, why in the world would God do such a thing? The reason God had the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute because God wanted his people to have a visual picture of what they were doing to him. You 
You see, the people of Israel, they were cheating on God. They were cheaters. They were cheating on God by giving themselves to other gods. They were, com they were guilty of, com of committing spiritual adultery. They weren't being faithful to God. And if, if you'll re read through the book of Hosea, you'll discover that, that once Hosea took Gomer as his wife, you will find that, that she was not faithful to him. She was unfaithful to him over and over and over. She was guilty of adultery, but through it all, Hosea never quit on their relationship. He continued to extend to her love and grace and mercy. And that was a picture to Israel that even though they had been unfaithful to him, God never quit on their relationship. He continued to extend to Israel love and grace and mercy. And eventually, wayward Israel responded to God's love, grace, and mercy, and they returned to him. So marriage was a picture to the people of Israel, and marriage is a picture to us. Marriage is an illustration of the oneness that God desires to have with us and the actions that he took to make it possible. <clears throat> and I just began to think of that. How marriage is a picture of man's relationship with God. And I began to think about the condition of marriages all around the world. And I thought, dear God, if that is a, if that is a mirror, then God have mercy on us. Because again, we, we think it's about something else, but really it's a it's a Sure, it's a, it's a mirror of, of, of this relationship that God desires to have with us. And so, to kind of tie all this together, I want to share with you just two actions that God took to make it possible for us to have a relationship with Him. And, and these are two actions that we also need to take in our marriages in order that our marriages will be the kind of reflection that God wants them to be in this world. And so the first action that God took was to love us unconditionally. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, here in this verse, John tells us that God did something for us because he loved us. John says that God gave his one and only son. Now, to understand what John is talking about here in verse 16, you have to look at it within the context of verses 14 and 15. In verses 14 and 15, this is what John writes. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Life. Now, if you were to read Numbers chapter 21, you would find the Israelites in the desert. They were speaking against God. They were speaking against Moses. They asked Moses in verse 5, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Well, remember in Egypt they were slaves. <clears throat> And God has set them free from the bondage that they were experiencing. And here they are grumbling against God. They're, they're grumbling against Moses. Well, God didn't like their grumbling. God didn't like grumbling. God loves gratefulness. And, and so you know what he did? Danny, you're going to love this. He sent venomous snakes among them. Now, aren't you glad that God doesn't do that today? I mean, aren't you glad that when we start grumbling against God, He doesn't send venomous snakes to, to live among us? That's what He did. And the snakes, they bit the people. And many Israelites died, the Bible says. Well, needless to say, that got the Israelites' attention. 
And they come to Moses in repentance and they ask Moses to pray that the Lord would take away the snakes. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. That's a smart prayer. The Lord says to Moses in verses 8 and 9, Make a snake, put it up on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. <coughs> Have you seen a symbol that resembles that? The medical, the physician, huh? You seen that? You look at it, it's a, it's, a, it's a pole with a snake wrapped around it. Where do you think they got that? I'll tell you, the Bible. The Bible, Numbers 21, that, that symbol comes from this passage of Scripture. He says, make a snake, put it up on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Because physician, physicians are charged with the task of helping people to what? Live. And so Moses, he, he makes this bronze snake, and he puts it up on a pole, and, and then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked at this bronze snake on the pole, and they lived. Now, here's the deal. Mankind, or the world, has been bit by a poisonous snake called sin. And sin's bite is a fatal one. So what did God do? God gave His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to save people from the death that came to them as a result of sin. Jesus Christ, He was lifted up just like that, that pole with that snake was lifted up. Jesus Christ, he was lifted up on a cross in death so that anyone who looks to him will live. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not die, but have eternal life. Now I want you to notice that God didn't put conditions on sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Nowhere in John 3.16 do you see that. God didn't say, here's the deal, world. I will send Jesus Christ to die for you if you do this, this, and this. And if you don't do this, this, and this. God didn't put any conditions on sending Jesus Christ to save us from sin and death. God loved us unconditionally. When we didn't deserve it, and weren't even asking for it. God loved us unconditionally. And that unconditional love made a way for us to have a relationship with Him. And for us to be saved from the clutches of death. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't do anything to earn such love. It was a love of choice. If our marriages are going to be the kind of reflection that God desires for them to be, then husbands and wives are going to have to learn to love each other unconditionally. We're going to have to quit saying to our spouse, I will love you if you do this and this and this, and if you don't do this and this and this. We're going to have to start saying to our spouse, I'm going to love you unconditionally. When you don't deserve it or are not even asking for it, I am going You know, if husbands and wives would begin to love each other with unconditional love, that unconditional love, it would make a way for, for a relationship to be, to be saved from the clutches of death. So that's the first thing. Love, love unconditionally. Now, we know that the Bible says that we're to love others as, as God loved us in Christ Jesus, right? And we know that He loved us unconditionally. You know, God didn't, God didn't put any conditions on, on His love for us. He he, he loves us unconditionally. And he even says to us, you know, uh, the Pharisees were really good about loving people who were like them. The Pharisees were really good about loving people who did what they wanted them to do. The Pharisees weren't really all that good at, at loving people who were different than them or who did things that they didn't like. And, and, and Jesus says, you know, how are you any different from the world? I mean, even the world loves those who love them. Jesus says, I want you to, to love unconditionally and it even goes a step further. He says, you know, you've heard it said, you know, love your neighbor. But he says, he said, I want you to even love your enemies. You know, and, and 
And sometimes we feel like our, our husband or wife is our enemy, right? No? You ever had a day like that? Come on now. <laughs> even on the worst day, right? Even on the worst day where you look at your spouse and you say, they are my enemy. What does Jesus say? Love them. <laughs> Pray for them like they're your enemy. Love them like, you're, like they're your enemy. And then hopefully the next day they're not your enemy. Love unconditionally. And again, this goes across the board. It isn't just, we, can, we can apply this to any relationship, right? Not just marriage, but any relationship. Second action that God took was to sacrifice completely. Yes, he loved us unconditionally in order that this relationship could be restored, but he also sacrificed completely. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, here in this verse, we discover that Jesus Christ died for us. Now, I have a question for you. Is there any greater sacrifice than to die for someone? <clears throat> Can you think of any greater sacrifice than to die for someone? I can't. I, I think that's the greatest sacrifice. When you die for someone, that is, a, that is the ultimate sacrifice. So when Jesus died on the cross for us, he made the ultimate sacrifice. He sacrificed himself completely in order that our relationship with God could be restored. Now, how likely do you think our relationship with God would have been restored if Jesus Christ would have said to us, I'll meet you halfway? I'll meet you halfway. Wait, you give a little of yourself on, on behalf of this relationship. I'll give a little of myself on behalf of this relationship. How likely do you think the relationship would have been restored if, if that would have been God's approach? Listen, the likelihood of the relationship being restored would have been about zero. We would have never met God halfway. We just never. A half-hearted commitment to the relationship by both members in the relationship does not result in a whole relationship. You know, so many times people will say that marriage, that the marriage relationship is a 50-50 proposition. If the husband will do his 50%, the wife will do her 50%, then the marriage will be 100%. How's that working out for you? I already know the answer. It's not working out very well. It's just not. Why? Because God didn't design marriage to be a 50-50 proposition. God designed marriage to be a reflection of the kind of sacrifice and commitment that he made on behalf of our relationship with him. And folks, Calvary wasn't a half commitment. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he sacrificed himself completely on our behalf. He didn't say, I'll meet you halfway. Jesus Christ said, I will go all the way to save this relationship. The way in which Jesus sacrificed himself on behalf of our relationship with God is the way that we should sacrifice ourselves on behalf of our relationship with our spouse and others. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 3, 3-5, through 5, he says, do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to write about you know, how, how um, Christ did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he, but he humbled himself and, and he became like a servant. He took on the appearance of, of man. He became a servant. And, and he, he became obedient to death. Even death on the cross. And Paul says, your attitude should be just like that. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Can you imagine what would happen in our marriages if husbands and wives began to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus? Can you imagine what would happen in our marriages if we quit trying to figure out how much we had to sacrifice and just laid our whole life down and sacrifice as Jesus did for the sake of the relationship. You know, I think that there would be a lot more marriages, not family, than husbands. 
would do what Ephesians chapter 5 says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Listen, that kind of love is irresistible. I mean, when you, when you heard about what Jesus Christ did for you, how he laid his life down for you, I mean, could you resist that love? Yeah, I couldn't. It, it made me want to have this relationship with him, to, to run to him, not, not run away from him, because, listen, there is no greater sacrifice than the sacrifice of death, and that's what Jesus Christ did for me. Husbands, if we would love our wives in such a way, listen, they would, they would run to the relationship. Not away from it. it isn't just about husband sacrificing, it's about wives sacrificing. Because if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, so many times, men, husbands who have just the wrong perspective on this verse, they will walk in and they will say, you're to submit to me. Again, how, I want to ask this question, man. How has that worked out? It doesn't work out. But what they forget is before, before that is ever written by Paul, Paul says there's mutual submission among brethren. When that happens, when everybody is sacrificing completely, no one's left. No one's left out. No one feels like they're getting cheated. No one feels like they're, they're giving more than the other. If everybody in the relationship is sacrificing completely and submitting themselves to what God wants in the relationship, no one feels like they're being left out. So we need to love each other with a never-fails kind of love. So as we bring this to a close today, let me just ask you an important question. What decision has the Holy Spirit been trying to persuade you to make as you've heard God's word today? Has there been a list of conditions that you've been placing on your spouse in order for them to be loved by you? Do you need to make the decision today to love your spouse unconditionally? Have you been looking at your marriage relationship as a 50-50 proposition instead of a total commitment? Because a lot of people do. Do you need to make the decision today to sacrifice completely for the sake of the, the marriage relationship? Let me ask this today. Has there, has there never been a time in your life when you've accepted the unconditional love of God as demonstrated by Christ dying? Do you need to make the decision to look to Jesus Christ as your Savior and live? Listen, whatever decision the Holy Spirit has been trying to persuade you to make, I want to encourage you to make that decision during this time of invitation. Don't just hear the Word of God today. Apply the Word of God. There's a reason the Holy Spirit is trying to persuade you. is because God loves you and He wants what's best for you. And to walk away from the voice of God and the conviction of God is to miss out on God's very best for your life. So today I invite you, during this time of invitation, come, be obedient. Maybe husbands, you want to take your wife by the hand and you want to come and you want to pray. Then God will give you. And never fails marriage. Maybe you just want to come down here today and you want to say, God, I'm doing my best. I need some help. I'm here to meet you. Wherever you're at. And again, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because here's what I know. There's not a person sitting in this room 
gotten touched in some way by divorce. All of us have. All of us have. So we don't, today we don't point our fingers at others and say, how could you? Because we don't know it. We don't know what people are going through. God does. He's all about taking something that might have been bad in our life, but He's all about taking it to redeem it for something good. To bring, to bring beauty out of, out of ashes. Whatever your story is today, we all have one. God can do that for you. He can bring beauty out of ashes if you let him. So I invite you to let him today. Every head bowed, every eye nobody looking around. Dear Jesus, I thank you. I thank you so much that you love us unconditionally and that you sacrifice completely. And as your word has gone forth today and pricked our hearts, may we respond in obedience. You might be glorified. We thank you for what you have done and what you're going to do now. In Jesus' name we pray and ask you. Amen. If you'll stand as we sing, again, don't wait. The Holy Spirit has been speaking your heart now. It's the time to come. Meet Jesus.